Hello and welcome to the Outcast. I'm your host, HC. With me are Wolf, Haddock, and Jaya. And we're all back again to, the, to discuss with you what happens when people are trying to pull strings uh, beneath you when you don't even know, aka part two of season one of Inside Job. Yes, this is apparently not a part two because Netflix advertises seasons like that. This is part two of season one. Wait, I am so around that. I think it's probably Netflix's new mandate that they ask for a package of episodes ahead of time and that they're released on a scheduled basis. The Cuffled show is similar because they released the whole show in a year and it's very implied that it was all ordered ahead of time with the pandemic delaying production. So that it doesn't thing, surprise though... me. It's not surprising because a lot of so, a lot of shows and streaming services are doing this too. But like this is literally a, par, a season one, part two, and like with Carpet, it was season one, two, three. The, this is literally a second part, but it's been released as a season. We are treating it as a season two. Um, I guess just to kind of go over this, uh, if you don't want to listen to all, to the episode we did about season one, you should. But to kind of sum it up. I really loved season one. It was one of my favorite shows last year. Really smart, really funny, and also had some uh, some great, some great characters. Um, guys, quick uh, quick question. Yes, of course. I think this was an amazing follow up to season one. Season one first. Season one first. We so season one. Just to, refresh the, just to refresh the people. All right. So season one is about Reagan Ridley, who should be top of the world as a genius and prodigy, about to inherit the CEO position at her father's company, Cognito Inc., that peddles in conspiracies. But the former CEO, a man named JR, who's a little smarty and corrupt, accurately tells Reagan that she has no social skills and she has dozens of HR write ups. So she has to earn her promotion by working with a leader named Brett, who, as she describes uh, let's, later, let's just assume, uh, Jaya. I know, I know that uh, it's good that you're recapping this, but I think people who watch this already know about season one. Just what did you think? So season one, I think, was amazing, smart, and funny, and I didn't know I wanted to watch it until Netflix saw the, showed the preview, and then I saw Alex Hirsch, and I'm like, yes, because. I dearly miss Gravity Falls, and I've been suffering Gravity Falls withdrawal since the show ended back in 2016. And this show yeah. isn't Gravity Falls, for the record. If you have kids, or you are a kid, and you're watching Gravity Falls, and you're coming to Inside Job expecting more, it's not going to be like that. It's basically a workplace office comedy with the cynicism of Rick and Morty and the otherness of Gravity Falls. So it's more yeah, like a but, uh, show for those who grew up on Gravity Falls and then went to college and grad school. Going back to, to whether we liked it or not, yeah, I was in the same boat um, as Jaya of just absolutely loving it, but I also had it, I came at it from a different angle of knowing right from the start who the show creators were, seeing the previews, etc. So I was chasing in, very much wanting to see it, and it met my expectations. So I've been following Inside Job, looking forward to that season two and it is already here and it's uh, if i recall yeah well if i recall that you were you liked season one but not as much as we did yeah i uh, i remember what i said <laughs> uh <laughs> I, I definitely remember the I, enjoyed one. It. <laughs> I had fun listen i'm allowed to forget things at this point yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'll uh, be 32 I you soon. It, but... All right, I'm like halfway there. I'm like close to the midlife crisis point at this point. All right, I'm allowed to forget things. That's actually, a big. Yeah, you know, actually, no spoilers, but it does, the season does imply that millennials are pushing 40 now. So yeah, just let me imply build it. God, straight up it says it. it. Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, no, that was no, that was uh, my favorite thing ever because that is my <laughs> literal pet peeve in entire life. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're not talking about spoilers yet, so we're not giving context yet. But uh, but basically, so season two is out. We watched it personally. I 
still really like uh, really like this show, love it even. Although with season two, I felt like there were a lot of things that I kind of needed to actually sit on and think after yeah. watching it. And, you know, after I sat down and thought about them and talked to some people about them, I realized, yeah, this was a really great season, on par if not better than season one. But I feel like this one, I needed to actually digest a bit. What do it's you a lot. I think I agree because it's a lot. There's a bit of a tonal shift. Because as mentioned, a lot of season one is centered around the dynamic that Reagan and her co-leader Brett have. Or rather, Brett is the unpaid intern who's getting, being given nothing to lead the team. Yeah. And season two focuses on the aftermath of the season one finale at first. And it changes from Reagan learning to get along with people to Reagan determining what her quest for happiness is. And unfortunately, there is still Reagan and Brett friendship. Because I think I, and I appreciate they made payoffs to that without doing extreme callbacks and continuity. But That's we also true. get, but we also get more of a far, more of an arc on who you are, what do you want out of life, and how do you not repeat mistakes when you're putting the work into a relationship? Yeah, but that's uh, but overall, you would say you like season two more or less than one. I think so. it's hard to say because season one doesn't have the Pope and an animatronic cow made by Disney Imagineers. Okay, this is spoilers. This is spoilers. This is. I guess people <laughs> are listening to this know this, but you know. Well, not in the spoilers territory yet. Not yet. No context. But, That's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, exactly. Hadek, what are, what's, on, what's on your mind regarding the thing? So, I did not like season one as much as season two. I still, I mean, blah, blah. Put that backwards. Still waking up. Um, <laughs> I didn't care for season two as much as season one. I still enjoyed it a lot, and it felt like, you know, coming home back to something I enjoyed. It's like, yay, I get more of these episodes. But um, there were certain areas in um, how it shifted that did not feel like it was a direct continuation of the first set of episodes that came before, as far as what relationships were the most important, what it was following. It was there, but it felt like just enough of a disjoint that I wasn't you know, it, it maybe it came from expectations of what I thought they were going to continue, but since they didn't focus heavily on the things I thought they should have, that's where I was sort of like, eh. And then also, again, yeah, it just depends per episode on whether the, each episode's premise is entertaining. Yeah, this is actually interesting because I think there's a lot of, you know, we went into season one not really knowing what to expect, and now that we kind of have a uh, Patients, it's like, oh, okay, this is where you're going. And sometimes you're going to like it more, sometimes you're going to like it more. But uh, both, I'm curious, what are your thoughts? I, I, I kind of agree with Haddock here in that there are parts of it that I really enjoyed, that I really liked, but th there was something that just felt off or disconnected. And I, I come back to, I really don't know if this, hey, we'll release a part of a season now and a part of a season later. I would be very curious to hear what someone thought who sat down and watched this for the first time and they watched all 18 episodes together and mm -hmm. how that made them feel and what they thought. <clears throat> because watching the first part and then waiting a year to get the second part, or a little over a year even, it felt, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it felt disjointed to a degree. It felt like there was a disconnect somewhere along the lines. And maybe that's because it was split up. Maybe <clears throat> it's more to do with what they chose to focus on after the fact. I'm not entirely sure. But it definitely, I had fun with it. I enjoyed it. I think it's a good continuation. But there definitely is something that just feels off, in my opinion. Yeah, I think one thing that season two doesn't talk about is the double standards that Reagan faces. And obviously for a good reason, because it's no longer a satire about what probably Shion Takeuchi was facing when building her career in animation. Because That's somewhat true, because I think season one did have a bit more of a satirical point of view, and this one does too. There's a, there's a lot of satire in this season, even out 
not say that in terms of the satire itself, it's still well done, but I think this is an small story rather than satire. And I think mm-hmm. in season one might have done, might have been a bit of the opposite when it comes to that. Yeah. So I I guess... to... yeah, go ahead. I want to go back to what um, Jaya was talking about as far as like um, how some of the objectives changed between the first part and the second part as far as that sense mm-hmm. of whether there was continuity or not. You know, the first half, you know, Reagan trying to get along, Reagan trying to get her dream job, balancing Reagan's relationship with Brett versus Rand. Like, all of that was very set through in the plot clear lines, right? You know, that's what we were focusing on for our storytelling. The second half felt a little off because it did not focus on all of those areas consistently again. It sort of went off into new ideas, which is fine, but it didn't continue on the old as much. Right. Like, one thing that felt like a disconnect was, spoiler alert, in the season one finale, Reagan's team turns on Rand and forces her to make a hard choice. But in season two, when the the situation's reversed, where she tries to convince them to turn against him, and none of them want to do it, not even who was the most vocal that Rand couldn't be trusted. And he was right. Brett is very wise. And it always felt like a disconnect. Like you could feel the snap in the bond visibly. And they don't explain why, apart from the implication that it's frogs, that they all expect Rand to fail eventually. And they're just uh, the way to it's also that, you know, let's be honest, is Cognito really a place where you can just quit and have a, and, you know, have a normal life and find another nine to five job? Like, wow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Season <laughs> spoilers. See, I thought it was very that, clear why they were not supporting Reagan at that point, yeah, based upon the entire work setup and work culture setup. Because we are all, well, lots of people are very familiar with the work culture setup of, you know, you have to risk your own butt to even have a job to stand up for someone else. Like, you're you're forced into a tight corner a lot. I just also want to say that if you remember the Daily Nap episode from season one, like, just because it, whenever Reagan just accidentally said something, she would just have a SWAT team, you know, make the person disappear. Imagine if someone actually walked there. They are not gonna let you off easy. Like something, something's gonna give. I don't think it's a place that you can just quit out of. But I guess the the more the better the better this is if we move to spoilers. I, Unless anyone true. has my bias is I've been reading too much about it because <laughs> I because I feel like if Reagan were to put up her situation on say not always right or on Reddit asking for advice. Everyone on there would just say, "Yeah, people tell him quit the job, but you can't really do that." Reagan, (laughs) Reagan, on am I the asshole? I mean, (laughs) yes, but a very justified one. The answer is going to be be... everyone's the asshole here in (laughs) every single situation and inside Uh, job. (laughs) No, like oh, people will tell him you're the asshole, but I agree with you. You need it to be. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Fair. Uh, oh, like uh, yeah. Actually, oh, you, know, you know what? Headaches, right? Everyone will just be everyone's an asshole. It's, it's called everyone. It's E S H. That's what the term is on I I T. It everyone sucks here. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's right. But at le- I'm put I'm putting this up just for Jaya. Whoever gets it, gets it. But at least nobody butter jokes. Thank you and good night. Moving on. Is George um, also going to be part of the conspiracy? Was there a reason he was buttered? Did that an alien invasion? Be. He might be, you know, if people know the story, they know it. Uh, write the fan fiction in the comments or something. So, so George I teaming think... up with a dog, a special yes. dog to take over humanity. We, will... we, we, Let's save the fan we don't need to go through it. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's plenty potential. And I just, <laughs> I think I just kind of opened the doors of hell to people who are there. <laughs> Oh, the people who are interested in this. So go nuts, that's on me. Do we get animatronic now, demons to go with that hell? Cool. So let's start spoilers for Inside Job Season 2 in 3, 2, 1. Still here, good. Shazam. 
I laugh my ass off. No, Josh no. Kazem. Get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so no. much. <laughs> Listen, when they had that thing, I'm like, I, I, I was like, I remember that movie having a different name. And then it's like, no, 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 it's Kazem. There's like this thing in the multiverse that's fucking up. I'm like, oh. But for, for oh, I was I'll... making fun of that movie. Making fun of that movie brings me joy. Like every time somebody makes fun of that movie. Mm. I did not I mean, have it, familiarity with that movie, but I started frantically right. googling the section they brought it up. I was the second they brought it up. I'm Listen, like, oh, Listen, here we go. Here's the thing, okay? I'm sure you've heard of the movie Scary Movie, you know, yep. uh, the, because it's a fan. So the best joke in that movie is literally at the start when there's a guy calling up this woman and going, "What's your favorite horror movie?" And she goes. Yeah, Kazam, you know, where Shaquille O'Neal plays a genie? That's not a horror movie. Have you seen Shaquille's acting? Probably. I have not, but that's I have awesome. heard many jokes about a video game Shaq Fu. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, that, it looks like quite the experience, I'm guessing. The, the, let's say that both of them are very special in their own way, but let's go back to good media now. So, um, <laughs> how do you want to approach this episode? The episode will just talk about topics that you want to talk about we could start like with it's going to be a little bit of each is going to be you know that happy medium is going to be a good conversation line hmm. okay so let's yeah. just uh, start with episode one how reagan got her groove back which is sadly not a sequel to the emperor's new groove oh, but that we better are... than what we saw <laughs> <laughs> uh yes definitely uh, so basically we are we so Rand is now ruling Cognito, and Reagan is very much not happy about it. Nope. But, but um, you know, but uh, you know, but uh, things might look up when when two things happen. One, Reagan attends an anonymous anger group where she meets a person she very much doesn't get along with, and she will never like. Wink, wink. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah, Ron Stadler from the Illuminati does not make which, the rest the way, of the Illuminati look good. Which, by the way, Giant had a kind of, remember, you two were kind of thinking that they might be siblings. I listen, I remember you mentioning it. Yep. Wolf? Yep. What were, what, what were your theories when you saw him? Oh, I figured, like, moment one, this is going to be like some super setup by Illuminati of, oh, big betrayal coming or the shadow board or something, right? That's what I figured. Like, hey, he's going to, they're going to get close and that's going to happen and then he's going to betray her. I like the way they went with it, though. I really like how yeah. they went with it. And we can go through that more later. When I first met him, I thought, okay, this is clearly they're doing a little bit of enemies to lovers. But because this is inside job and it has a lot of, you know, dismal, you know, hum- humorous dismalness to it, there's gonna be mm-hmm. there's gonna be a twist and it's probably gonna be some sort of dark, funny thing. I noticed that they had like similar eyebrow shapes and things like that. So I'm like what if they're siblings? What if they go there? What if they? What if that's their twist? And I'm like, it's something that a topic they would touch. You know, have mm-hmm. sex, realize your siblings. There oh, goes right. the next relationship. You know, you sort know, of thing. Right. they almost they, they almost did that to Veronica Mars, and it actually got the main character to throw up. I like if he were actually a brother, this would fuck Reagan up. So thankfully, he is not. I I yeah. just kind of figured they're going to be, you know, you know, the enemies to lovers. But for all intents, they did their relationship really well, and yes. it leads to one of my favorite parts in the, in this first episode, where they're kind of, you know, um, so they have those uh, mind control things that you know take control of a friend and the little of the Illuminati in this, uh, you know, in this ceremony, and. And you know, as uh, the, as they start fighting and start making out, they make Rand and the little the Illuminati actually make out in public, and they're like, "I thought that this was really good. I got a good chuckle out of that." That, that was, was yeah. very good. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. And also, speaking of that uh, party, uh, Wolf's favorite person, who is not singing the Rescue Riders theme, 
Lin Manuel Miranda is in this show. And <laughs> I will Miranda. retain. I am so sad about this that because he does voice the character in Bojack Horseman, meaning he's not above doing the random cameo and showing off. But, but I think, alas, I, it's I, not him. It, it, it's not him voicing himself, but I guess it's just because, you know, when every when every other celebrity kind of has someone else doing it, I guess it's just for the thing that they don't want to put the actual celebrities in something like this. So, so I can go. I mean, yeah. I've got to show you the Bojack course master with Daniel Radcliffe because he's a fan of this for the fun of Bojack and he has a lot of fun with it. Oh, thank you, Walt, for it. But then, uh, Walt, you wanted fun. to say. Yeah. Yeah, Jay keeps Joe's quoting him from my brother. He keeps quoting Daniel Radcliffe's various lines from that episode. But anyway, yeah. the reason why it's sad is that before probably this, before this though, I just Wolf started saying something. I no, no, I, I'm I'm not gonna. It's it's really not worth it. <laughs> oh my! Is it something about the Rescue Riders team? No, well, no, well no. That's. Done. That's always worth it. I will always say that Lin Manuel Miranda still owes us him singing the Rescue Riders theme song because he should. And until then, he's know, just man. not cool. I don't know. I've seen him sing the Magic School Bus theme song. It unfortunately, a good voice cannot go up against shoddy animation. All respect to Magic School Bus writing and fans. I'm just, I'm just saying he's just not cool until he sings the Rescue Riders theme song. Yeah. I mean, I have not heard this argument before, but I'm excited to Uh Well, I will promise I will send him the, mag the Magic School Bus cover Lynn did. But anyway. Let's, nope, doesn't but yeah. matter. He's just only cool Jesse Riders. Let's just say that weird things happen in this podcast. So, yikes. Yep. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, so... On that note, yeah, so it's not, but, but I just, I have to say the line of, you know, no wonder people pay $200 to, to see him getting shot every night. That line <laughs> got me. That was great. Yeah, uh, at the same yeah. time, I mean, I'd have to rewatch season one, but I remember their celebrity appearances being a little bit more staggered. Um, with the first yeah. two episodes of season two, it was very heavy celebrities to the point it was a little off-putting to me. It, as much because, as I love yeah. Lynn manuel Miranda and, you know, like my sister loves Keanu Reeves and, you know, oh, stuff like that. Them. So... It was just a little bit too much at once for me. <laughs> at, That's fair enough. At the very least, yeah. like it, it, it's it's very front loaded. After that, it it very much yeah, dies down phrase. quick. Yes, that's it. One thing I am surprised that they followed up with is in the previous season, Gigi mentioned she'd been sending her application for years to the Illuminati, and yeah, I've been there, girl. It with job applications that are fruit that are very fruitless. And the scene that makes all the other, the subplot that the most of the cast has, while Reagan is sabotaging a most dangerous game hunt, for reasons, mm -hmm. is they all get upset on Gigi's behalf when Lynn insults her for thinking that she could, is Illuminati material. And so they immediately declare war, which yeah, leads to one of the most hilarious bait and switches, because... You think that by Brett, by challenging both Jay Z, who is also Illuminati, and Lynn Manuel to a rap battle, would lead to a rift between the two because Lynn says he's the greatest rapper of all time, which he and is. it does, <laughs> and it does not go in that direction. No, it does not, and it is great. Mm -hmm. But uh, honestly, I think besides uh, you know all the fun stuff, the the one. One thing I will say kind of uh, left me air about it, and you know, that's not just a season, is that we are starting with the entire, you know, with Reagan's downfall after the ran to over, and, you know, her episode was really, you know, get, coming to grips with that, and after she tried to destroy him, and she finds something else in Ron, which uh, helps her, you know, move forward and everything. But then... Hell and Ren's relationship kind of vanishes for the rest of the season, and I think that's a problem when we find out later that her, alongside Tamiko, but not just, 
is actually is actually like a big motivation for why Rand is Rand. So yeah, I, looking back, looking back, that that's a bit that I think they could have done better in the entire scene, like because it kind of disappears and Rand being the head of Cognito is just a status quo now that doesn't really impact anything. Yeah, yeah. I, I will. I am going to disagree with you in that I think it's very in character for Rand. In that he talked about putting all this effort, but it's shown consistently he doesn't want to. And he takes it for granted that as long it's as he runs that. Cognito, it will be there. And Reagan's relationship becomes healthier for her that she cuts him off when he tries to come to her promotional support. It's about and, through lines, though. Good point. Yeah, yeah. like it's, uh, yeah. I, what I mean is that, you know, when we see Rand and Reagan act, in this season, it, they are kind of separated from each other. Raiden is focusing on her stuff, Rand is focusing on his stuff, which by, by all means, they, their, pl- their plot lines are good, right? But I think it just kind of went away a bit too quickly and came back way too quickly that suddenly him taking over at, this, at the end of season one, something that really broke her, it just kind of become a status quo thing. And I know you and I talked about this um, before this podcast, HC, about this exact topic of that yeah. sort of disappearing. Because that was the thing that I was looking forward to the most at the end of season mm-hmm. one, was to see the dynamics between Rand and Reagan changed now that he was the boss. Because, you know, the entire first season was sort of a juxtaposition between Reagan and Brett versus Reagan and Rand. So yes. the fact that Reagan and Rand's relationship was basically not there, and the fact that I saw somebody else online talk about Rand's bossitude was more played as a joke for most of the mm-hmm. season. And it's not to say that it yeah. wasn't, wasn't in character, but it was this disjunct in narrative where one of the main relationships that was set up to be a crux of the show in the first part was more or less dropped as Rand was chasing way too much after Tommy Co. proportionally to the size of the show. I I told HC we needed to have Rand, you know, going after Reagan in some capacity, having that head butting up in order for the end of the season to make sense, in order for there to be good continuity, etc. Yeah, so, but, and again, for that, like, actually, when Rand's ploys being played more towards comedy, again, I found them funny, but when I look at the entire package, and this, and it's not like it's like something like, let's say, Spongebob, which is a very you know, episodic kind of thing, it's, the the show has continuity. So when it suddenly loses it, and this thing is supposed to be like a heart of a, ver- of a very particular, you know, specific scene near the end of the show, and it's supposed to justify you know, a character's motives, yeah, and that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, they, they like, there was, like, even before the review, I was like, there's, even before the reveal, there was too much Tommy Co, and I was sitting there craving Reagan and Rand interactions. I'm like, give this to me. This is supposed to be some of the complexity and heart of the show. And they, they just brought it back out of nowhere out of seven. And it would have hit so good if they mm-hmm. had built up in any yeah. way well, for the, the relationship. You have to say, uh, Wolf, I'm curious. What do you think? No, I agree. I, I'm, I'm very much of the opinion of that. Yeah, it felt based off of the ending of part one and like everything they built up within part one of uh, Inside Job. It, it definitely felt yeah. like yeah, it it just it disappeared for more of the hey jokey boss time, which again, as you said, there's nothing wrong with it. I enjoyed a lot of it, but it, it felt like we built something up and we're not really going to focus on that anymore because now we're focused more on Reagan specifically and some of her specific issues. And I see that they were probably trying to do a parallel through line between Rand and Tommy Co. and then Reagan and her own new relationship, which is an uh. interesting concept. But unless you have Reagan and Rand interacting directly, you are losing 
you know that through line yeah it's i feel like especially if the reveal at the end is going to be rand wanting to get reagan back and reagan acts somewhat sympathetically towards it after the end of the season one finale that should not have been her reaction yeah Yeah. so but well i guess we'll talk about this again but uh, going on to episode two Eh, Woz Feratu. Let's say the name of the episode tells you everything. This is a great name and this is a great, like I think of all the satire that the show has done, this might be my favorite. And before we actually talk about the episode, just two notes that I just have to get out of the way. And I know, and I know Haddock and Jaya already know this, but Wolf doesn't, so I'm gonna, so I'm gonna tell him now that Keanu Reeves and Johnny Depp are not voiced by themselves in this episode. They are voiced by great voice actor Roger Craig Smith, a.k.a. Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm so happy. (laughs) Uh Of course you are. And actually, looking, looking at the IMDb page, Wolf, Sonic the Hedgehog also voiced Buzz Aldrin in season one, aka the character which made you really, which starred in your favorite episode. So, ha. Huh. I don't remember this. I don't remember me saying that was my favorite episode. Thankfully, it's recorded, so you don't have to. Just make a note to delete that video later. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> hey, that the truth. It. On on that note, uh, another thing that I re- there's a joke in this episode where like Keanu Reeves mentions that he has a, a cat named Keanu, which is based on a film about a cat called Keanu. That is a real movie. Thanks to my girlfriend for showing this to me because this movie that's, is. Something I thought that was a joke. That's a real. That's a real. Okay. That's a real movie, and and I showed it to Jaya too. Jaya also knows it's a real movie, and I cannot believe that it exists. Like obviously, the cabinet is adorable, but the premise was it is was nuts. it was it good? <laughs> and, like it starts it, like no. there's a point. Where, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll say it. It has moments where it drags a bit, but it's hilarious. <laughs> okay, so it, okay. I'm, I mean, I'm the a premise little I interested. wasn't expecting, like, quality. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but... No, just... but I'm I'm curious, I'll admit. I thought it was a fake thing, but it's real. I'm No, shocked. it's real. Okay, so, okay. The thing that, not about Keanu Reeves, but going back to season one, the thing that I can't believe they predicted, well, I mean, not pre- really predicted, but it ended up coming out way too timely speaking of celebrity yeah. comments was the comment this is going to be the most globally damaging midlife crisis since elon musk i uh, just absolutely <laughs> lost my crap <laughs> and the best part is we don't know if it was a prediction or if it was just a shot in the dark but it's yeah, just the timing I... the absolute There's... timing oh, man, yeah. of its release i just i could yeah. not believe Actually, it yeah. Yeah, when they mentioned that, I was like, holy shit, that is wonderful timing. Yeah, I just, sorry, I was just like, speaking of, like, because between the, is the cat named Keanu or Elon Musk having a midlife crisis most likely to have been written off of something in reality, I would have said the former, but it's actually, well, I would have said like, you know, the Elon Musk one, obviously, but it was actually the freaking cat is, you know, based on what they knew at the time. That, that's how my yeah. brain got there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because in all fairness, Elon Musk for a few years wants to arrange microchips in people's brains, like yeah. the musical Be More Chill. Yeah. I, all I'm going to say is I wonder in the next season if they're, actually, if they're going to somehow reference the fact that they were right on the money. But I guess we'll have to wait until then. It's got to be a weird. Twitter, a Twitter-related episode could actually be pretty good. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, be... we, 
it's got to be weird though to write for shows like this at this point or write for things like the onion like mm -hmm. yeah what happened reality <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, good, good option. But on that, that note, I guess back to episode two. For real, I think this is one of the smartest uh, satires we have on Hollywood, and like yeah. from both sides, you know, from both, from both, like uh, you know, uh, the Tamiko dating dating Keanu Reeves, and you know, Megan Kaya trying to stop uh, stop Keanu Reeves from uh, you know sucking Tamiko's blood. Uh, all the way to Rand attempting to become a movie star to get Tamiko back and hiring Drex to make the movie for him and essentially turning himself into a baby. And just how everything connects together. Like, there's good action in this episode it as well. Good. Like, holy yeah. shit. And, yeah. like, I'm usually not someone who likes pop culture references to celebrities in shows. It gets old fast, it gets outdated fast, it feels too standard and common. But the them hitting Keanu Reeves worship was just the perfect niche for me that cracked me up. I did not care for the yeah. Rand B plot line as much as I do like the idea of him de-aging. I didn't really care for the movie part of it, but... um. No, it was a very well put together episode. I I definitely appreciated it. Mm -hmm. yeah, this, got, uh, this was a good one. Mm -hmm. We also got confirmation that Andre will be a good parent because it's his fault that Rand becomes a baby and that the aging potion goes wrong. And yeah. so when Rand's about to fire him, Andre puts on Baby Shark, which <laughs> immediately distracts him. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. this is the best. Yeah, Andre's going to be a good parent. Uh, at least to Rand. I'm not sure about actual babies, but who knows. Right, look, if anyone can take care of Rand as a baby, they can take care of anyone. Yeah, but you have to have yeah. a certain type of off-kilter to deal with Rand. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I was about to say, but you know, like, you know, a baby shark isn't necessarily a movie I would show any type of baby. This is only for the specific case of Rand becoming a baby. Uh, yes. Well, uh, to be fair, we learned baby shark in the camp in the full verses, which involves a girl getting her arms and legs bitten off. And so... I want to point out, you say, you say you have to be a certain type of off-kilter to take care of Rand. What, you mean, what you're what you implying there is you have to be high in order to take care of Rand. Yes, that is exactly <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly why he should not take care of actual babies. Yes. <laughs> okay. So yes, clear. I, okay. <laughs> I admit I like the little gags in the film subplot, like Nick actually being a good director was shocking. That he had dedication to quality because I didn't know the yeah. mushroom had it in him. And I mean, also honestly, honestly, if uh, as as a film major, if there's anyone in this group that would make a good movie director. Uh, it will be him. Like, he, he has the chops. That he does. So anything, anything else about uh, episode two? I think there's one interesting serious note they touch on. is the fact mm -hmm. that Tamiko likes Keanu and she doesn't mind the vampire stuff. But she does mind, and it's not implied, said, but outright implied that he lied to her and endangered Reagan. Because no one yeah. talks, because it's not really touched upon that Tonico is a narcissist, fully admitted to be one, selfish and mostly abusive. But you see, but if Reagan's actually in danger, she'll toss all that away to try and save her daughter, which is better than what we can say for Rand, who doesn't seem to care if someone threatens Reagan. I think because... both of them are really, really flawed parents, and both of them do have their sense of care about Reagan, which we do see in season two. It's just going to be how they react to different circumstances, which is or isn't going to pull that out. On that note, something I just uh, I do appreciate, you know, for an episode that's kind of front-loaded with celebrities, because that's the joke that celebrities don't age. Uh, but when you make the joke that they're on vampires, I'm kind of happy that they didn't go for the obvious uh, Robert Pattinson joke. That, you know, he's not, he's not being presented as a vampire, considering he was in Twilight 
and is now Batman, I'm happy they didn't go with the obvious joke. Just a random thing to point out. I think they did their jokes right in that episode. Uh, yes. Agreed. With that said, moving on to episode three, which is Reagan and Michelle's high school reunion. reunion. I did not high care school for this reunion. Episode. Yeah, I was about to say this. So like, this one I could literally skip. Like nothing, nothing really happens. It's like I, I like the idea on paper, but execution, I didn't really care for this one. It felt like going back to high school stereotypes in a very bizarre way that people would not act like. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you I, could I, make I, the argument. You love this. Okay? No, no, you know I didn't like I this episode. I enjoyed, I was just going to say, I agree. This wasn't my favorite episode either. It was kind of meh. But I did enjoy the Rowan Atkinson drug trip. That was fun. Okay, yeah, that was funny. That was funny. I'll there give were you some that. entertaining moments in it, and this actually goes to one of the big pros I think that season, well, part two, whatever, had over the first part, is that there was good team cohesion. Mm -hmm. Is the broader team mm -hmm. that uh, at Cognito Inc. had good chemistry with each other. In the first part, they were just sort of there, and they were separate personalities, and I didn't really care for the team dynamics. It was in episodes like this. Where you see, you know, like Andre and Glenn having, you know, <laughs> a, a, a drug experience together and bonding over yeah. that. That you get the the team working together in ways that were legitimately fun. And you have different pairings and different interactions with each other. So I take small positives from things like that. So even if I didn't really care for the premise and lots of the execution and lots of the A plot. There's things like that in there to still enjoy. Actually, thinking about it, a lot of those little small side plots for the team was kind of centered around Glenn there for a bit. You have in this episode, uh -huh. Glenn and Andre. In episode one, it was Glenn and Mick, or Mike, sorry. Yeah. And the uh, next episode, too, is about this is the B plot is going to have all the Glenn as well. Yeah. Oh, which and then the to. airplane one, which, for the record, I'm That's so, the next episode. so happy about. And, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that was Glenn, too. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Mm hmm So, any... I get Jaya, you didn't really talk about episode three. What do you have to... What are your thoughts? Sorry, um, what I was going to say was I think it's very weird that Mick is actually the nicest of his kind. Like, that was a bit yeah. of a shock. There was a lot that felt disingenuous about this episode as versus the yeah. backstory. It just did not sync up with who we knew him to be as a person. Mm. From him being, yeah. like, the nerd type of person in his past. Like, no, he never was. Um, he It's not his type of personality. Like, how he cared about fitting in with them, not his type of personality. You know, he... There's a difference between someone being defensive and being hurt and um, distancing themselves. And someone like him, where he was set up to just be this straight-out asshole. And so, you know, there's deconstructions that are good. This was not one of them. It just did not feel Actually, bad. now that I think about it, I have a realization. You know what this episode is? I, I, I know for a fact everyone in this call have seen this movie. But you know in the first Venom movie... Well, we just see Venom being this, you know, badass alien that kind of uh, keeps telling Eddie, you're a loser, you're a pussy, and all that. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, they just throw us, you know what, on my planet, I'm kind of a loser, like you. And it's like, huh? Where did this come from? That's what? exactly what it is. <laughs> so somebody took this and, ma and made an entire freaking um, episode of it. And it's like... You can't take one line and turn it into a full 22-minute episode. Yeah, so, yeah, it was just, I didn't really no, care we, for it. We should ask, what did we think about the B-plot of this episode? Where we didn't actually mention it, but JR's back. Woo, in episode one, he escaped. Oh, yeah, that, <laughs> I, I am not entirely sure about why Rand would go into this, like, why this specifically, you know, but it was kind of funny when he found them in there and they just kind of acted 
like you know all the, you know old friends <laughs> you know we kind of catching up suddenly and then when you know what I'll make you an intern and he's back in the and he's back in the company yeah that's pretty much it it's just a side thing it's not too much to it it's okay again like this is I would say one of if not probably the weakest episode of part two of this season mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anything else on it, or shall we move on to episode four? Yeah, Mothman needs more love. Like, this episode, <laughs> he's been an MVP of the whole season. Yeah, yeah, so, episode four, we found love in a pop in a populous place. Um, it's one of the best we, episodes of the season. Yeah, I was Agreed. about to say, not only, one, not only one of the best episodes of this season, but also a good date episode. Mm-hmm. Kinda. Just don't think about the season finale and you'll be good. But uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, so I love this one. It's great. <laughs> like both the A and B plots are just fantastic. But uh, Haddock, yeah. I think you want to talk about the B, about the B plot. So gosh, have at it. gosh, I mean, you know, oh my gosh. Okay. I mean, as a lifelong Coloradoan, to have them going through DIA and all of the um, the con the controversies and the legends that we have, <laughs> that was just a dream come true for me. To literally have them touching on all these stupid Illuminati things, Lucifer, the demon horse, like all the I just absolutely was so happy. <laughs> I just wanted to run around and start sharing this with my friends <laughs> who have never heard of the show. <laughs> like, I literally yeah. don't have much to say about it. Like, you know, the, the plot execution say... of it was okay as far as the mm -hmm. actual, you know, travel plot. It, but the, the fact that they went there at all made me very happy. <laughs> like, they could have done more with it. Uh, anything anything go can I can I go real quick? Go. So anyway, anyway, so uh, where am I going with this? Uh, well, let's start with this. I've been to Italy. I so when you are actually there, it some it somehow becomes it somehow becomes funnier because they obviously didn't replicate the street. You know, it's obviously not how it looks in real life but the fact that you know you've been you've been to where the pope is you've been to to that country in general so you kind of pick up on some things and they did and you know there are just a bunch of small things that you're like oh i see i see that little details that's that's always appreciated but too i think it was just an overall good episode for reagan and his relationship and like how Sometimes mixing business with uh, you know you know business with pleasure can uh, can screw you over, and that not, both of them are not perfect, but they man but they actually talk and manage to move, move forward with it. And the, you know the entire montage of them saving Italy while also having while also just having a fun date with each other was really fun. And I I also like when Reagan attempts to go to get into hell. And she tells the god, like, I know who you are, or something from the 69. It's like, okay, okay, go ahead. Yes. And, she, and, and, then, and then she goes, oh, lucky guess. <laughs> so that, yep. that was great. And the, the entire thing with Glenn at the airport, and like, if, you know, if Marines are part of the army or not, and all of that thing, that, the, the, everything about this episode was just fun. Like, I, I really enjoyed it. It was really, really fun. Episode. And the thing is, when the premise started, my first thought was, uh-oh. Because I have a lot of issues with how lots of media depicts um, religion or stabs at religion. But this was just way too fun. And I I had no problem with how they mm. just went... Because they, they just went crazy, right? And it was... Mm -hmm. it, it was definitely a highlight just a good yeah, idea. Yeah, basically, the religion itself, it's neutral. It basically, Reagan got impatient, 
and pauses the whole episode because she messes with Ron's device to give the Pope a push towards <laughs> greenlighting animatronic hell. I do wonder yeah. if they, I think this is the funniest episode for all the reasons you mentioned. I do also wonder if it's a good if the character Ron is a reference to the good place, and this episode seems to directly reference that. Because the talk about what is deserved, what isn't, and Reagan literally going into a version of hell to save him, mm -hmm. and how they yeah. just, and, uh, and without by the way, spoiling I anything, guess, uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, to all the, you know, uh, developing teens that might be watching this episode. No, doing this in a confession room is probably not going to save you from your sins, but I guess it's fair if it's a confession room in hell. Yeah. Don't fuck do me up, what can I say? I do appreciate how Ron's Catholic guilt, because he revealed he used to be a choir, he used to be a Catholic, is played both seriously and funny, and that you can tell he's weighed down by a lot of the things he did, and he even has a cheaty moment. To the point where the animatronic priest listening to it then it's so relieved when Reagan pretends to be switching shifts with him and saying, yeah. Oh, thank God, this guy is going on. Which I thought was hilarious, yeah, I, considering Ron. I also love the ending where, like, after the other, the other, uh, you know, the other guys are finally out. I've been in Italy, all of them just come to the city else, and then you just see that the entire city is just done, the intensity is just broken, it's not it's not looking well, the intensity is just ruined. That yeah. good visual guy. And you know, and it's serious when Brett actually has the logical reaction while Gigi just who knows what happened, just tossing their suitcase on the ground. <laughs> and she's like, dang it, Reagan. Well, Brent's like, yeah, we're going to have to cover this up, aren't we? Yeah, well, that's their job. That's what they, that's what they go to walk. Uh, and speaking of Brett and Walk, the episode five is Brett Walk. Uh, Wolf, I'm putting you on the spot. What did you think? Oh, no. I, hmm. I thought it was good. <laughs> I I think this is a, a good Brett-focused episode, seeing more of his family and kind of all of his issues and deep diving into that more. He's definitely been a bit quiet and in the background and kind of just going along up until now, so it was good to have that. And I feel like it was a good continuation of his character and kind of coming to that end point for him of, okay, he's moving past being a yes man right and it sets up well for our finale our like kind of two-part finale with episode seven and eight mm -hmm. so especially eight in my opinion I, I i also i this is another episode that i really like for one we get to see more of Brad developing as a fellow son and you know against his family in some sense that you know he's like you know what no you are you know, I'm, you know, you're going to respect me and I'm going to earn it. But also just the entire, again, when it comes to satire, the show does really well. <laughs> I think, I think everyone really needed like a satire about, you know, president. Right wing news, basically. Yeah. I was left wing news. Yeah, but uh, also, but considering also because he started, he starts as like just replacing for you know the what you know to what its face the um you know oh, to, to the weatherman to, to the weatherman guy and and then and then somehow we just becomes this thing and Randy and this is something that I really think was clever with the Randy trying to get uh, back. It's like wait, if I turn him into a president. He can pass. He can pass forward a law that would uh, that uh, you know would force chemical to date. So in this, if it wasn't something that was gonna over, I think this would have been a. Perfect, this is a perfect trend ploy. This is a perfect trend plan that he would pull out. Using you know sending someone to do the dirty work and the elections and stuff for him so that he could get what he wants. That's that's yep. kind of that's kind of brilliant, and, and what's hilarious is, is 
he uses. The, I just want to magic. mention. Yeah, and but I also want to mention that you know when the we can I don't recall it was ever a thing, but uh, we found in this episode that he really likes doing puppetry, and he uses that skill to kind of tell his followers, "Don't put all this pressure on me," but also tell his family. How about actually start treating me like a real freaking person? That I think it was really good for him. I think it was. I do like that Robotus. Mm-hmm. I do uh, like that Robotus like from the episode. I'm oh, sorry, you go ahead. Alec, you barely you have anything to say? I don't have anything to say. I'm just listening. <laughs> Oh, okay. So you agree, basically, with everything that's been brought up. Um, so this was a more of a middling episode for me. I do like yeah. your points about it being good Brett character development and Brett-centric, which was a very good contribution to the show. Yeah. Okay. I... Uh, Jaya, you wanted to say before? I will... There is so much to say about it. I do like... I do like that Robotus, of all people, is the one that starts writing Brett scripts and then later becomes both his campaign manager and his campaign saboteur because Brand making Brett run for senator means his family is going to disown him. One of the best parts of this is that Brett says, if I run, my dad will hate me, but if I don't run, your dad will hate me. And I'm like, dude, they're both terrible people. They're not worth it. Yeah. They do what makes like you happy. Literally, no, no win situation here. I, I will say. No, but I do. Admit, mm-hmm, you oh, go, no, Walt. Go ahead. All right. All right. I, I just wanted to say real quick, I, I will say that um, when their fake news show became more popular than Fox News and they showed Fox News and Rush Limbaugh's on the warpath, run. That joke cracked me up more than it probably should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was Rupert Murdoch because Rush Limbaugh is dead. Oh, yeah, I think Rupert even Murdoch, in the inside job, even first. It's all good. If it was Rush Limbaugh, it would have also been in character. Very much so, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I probably I enjoyed robot- that joke more than I should have. To be fair, this was a really funny episode. I was watching it with my older brother, and I know he finds an episode funny when he has to pause because he is laughing so hard, which is what he did for Brett's script, courtesy of Robotus, basically being an AI generator. Listening to, but I can tell you, AI generate inner AI generators for content do sound like gibberish, and the fact that it comes out sounding like artificial unintelligence is very on the point because Robotus writes a script for Brett about how vegetarianism will mean that cows will eat golf courses. And my brother had to pause after Brett said that with complete sincerity and just <laughs> cracked up for several minutes. <laughs> it's a great line, and on rewatching it, it is still hilarious the way Brett says, yeah. A vegetarian is and the problem is the cows will rise up and eat all our golf courses. I like my meat the way I like my chemicals with no regulation, something like that. <laughs> then that also- and more so because it's a sweet cinnamon roll. It's our sweet cinnamon roll saying it that makes it hilarious. Because it's bread. Who does not have bone in his body. So I also do mm-hmm. like that I'm basically Brett and Brett and Robotis have really as they did in the pilot. Because Robotus were schemes to build Brett's scripts. And then when Brett begged for help to find a solution that will please everyone, Robotus like, okay, we'll sabotage you. Which leads to probably the funniest montage in the show. Proving that Brett could not be evil, or even framed for evil if he tried. That was the highlight of yeah. the episode for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And <laughs> like when he... just how bad of a politician he is. Because he can be an asshole. Bad slash good, because he was getting <laughs> well done. Good, considering. Yeah, that's true. That's I mean, true. That, like, I think that for really president. hits me. Yeah. I, would, because I, would, I would want him broken. His hair would turn white in five years. <laughs> Probably, yeah. But, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't even I'm like it yet. I'd vote for him, but I want to wrap him in bubble wrap with air holes. But I do love that when he they try to do the classic sex scandal, he actually asks the escort, what do you want to do? And sits and talks with her. And Reagan is like, how did you unionize say, the sex industry and legalize it? And Brett said, I was just listening. Like, even he's not sure how that happened. <laughs> and later, when trying to get trying to trying to get caught doing cocaine with a drug lord, he accidentally sneezes a- while taking a line and kills the drug lord with maple leaves, which I'm still not sure how that works. And okay. the Canadian government, the Canadian Mon- Mounties laud him for being part of a sting operation to get rid of a powerful drug lord and while high he says let's talk about water and reagan's like you brokered a water deal to deal fight the forest fires in california yeah like <laughs> it's like like just goes to show that you know that you know brett is the best politician because he's sincere and he's also getting job done uh, stuff done so, but at the same time, we can't really have him as president because we can't have nice things. Well, also, he would uh, snap. He would, like, the guy would break in a matter of let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, but, I guess uh, we are moving on to episode six because I don't, uh, I think we kind of covered everything. I think well, we, we didn't talk about about the fact that Robotus mocks Reagan for deciding the only blast resort is faking Brett's death. He points out, yeah, that went really well last time. Yeah, but I think it was just, you know, <laughs> like a, a quick jab. It's not a big thing in the episode, but it was a nice thing. I don't know. <laughs> Reagan got an on-screen death. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so episode six. Being threatened and being torn apart by an angry. Mm-hmm. That that uh, good thing that didn't happen. So episode <laughs> six is Rontagon, Rontagon, which. Um, what do you guys have to say about this one? I think it's like an. Uh, all right, it's okay, I guess. Um. I'm really to... recycling a Rick and Morty episode from season one. For me, what really brings up to mind is um, Ron's character, which I don't think we've really talked about in depth yet here. Because, like, the episode itself, you know, good ideas. I don't really have anything specific to say. But as far as the overarching Ron as a character, Ron as a character arc, you know, I could talk about him specifically for a while. Oh, is but, that you know, you before should? you do before you do that before you do that, actually, I just say that you know the entire. I found it interesting that suddenly you know when Brett meets uh, meets Ronnie, it's not like you know I actually don't click with this guy. I don't know what it is. I just can't. Click. And it's nice to show that even that he eventually does right. But it's nice to see that even Ron has those like limits. You know, it's gonna. It it gives him a bit more of a dimension, I suppose. But and I think like the B plot though, it, I really enjoyed. I, I I love the B plot where Rand is trying to do this date with uh, Tamiko, but he but you know he puts <laughs> you know he puts uh, Alpha Beta in the you know in the you know it, it, to replace him while he's going to the bathroom, and he ends up being a better Rand than Rand. Because Tamiko actually falls for him again, and they just have this big—they just have this big fight with each other. And then Tamiko is like, "You know what? I, I, fuck both of you. I'm out." I—I—I I, I, I thought it was a—I thought it was a fun B plot kind of scenario. This is another one where, like, if Rand hadn't been constantly going over Tamiko, I could have had more fun with it. But I really yeah. do like the concept of the end result. I did get tickled out of the, you know, <laughs> falling in love with the robot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny. What can you do? And, and you know, and everything which just, which just really good. 
Um, so you want to talk about Ron? I do. All right, talk about. But Wolf probably do. Do you have anything to say? No, no. Go ahead. I'm curious to hear what you have to say about Ron. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Well, I hadn't prepared anything, so you know we're just going off the cuff. But honestly, like, I think that they did a really good job with his character in just all the way through, I was not expecting to really like him when he was first introduced because I'm like, oh, we're doing the standard enemies to lovers sort of thing. Uh. But he was actually a really good character in himself and he and Reagan had legitimately good chemistry. So um, he had a very interesting sensitive side, which you see in episodes like this where he's concerned about other people liking him. He's concerned about the ethics of the job in these situations. That was a really fun just thing to think through is, you know, the type of person who's good at their job but is feeling uncomfortable and sort of contrast that with Reagan who sort of bulldozes through the ethics because she wants the end result and doesn't care and so I, I was glad that this type of personality was brought into the show and worked agreed mm -hmm. like, very much agreed. like it, it, it's yeah I, I enjoyed seeing yeah it was just it was fun seeing this kind of character work within a show like this because generally a character like this is either going to be, especially with Enemies to Lovers trope, very one note or a part of the kind of dismalness of it all. But no, like he was very much set apart from that to a degree. And it, it I think, made him more enjoyable to see the progression, even though he was literally only in eight episodes, right? But they did it yeah. very well with the eight episodes that they had. And frankly, it makes the relationship more interesting, too, because mm. it's not just him and Reagan getting along, but it's him with all these complexities and him processing through it in a different way than Reagan. Yes. So it makes us attached to him more. It makes their relationship feel more authentic. It just pulls him into the show very authentically, even though he's popping in later as a romantic interest, which lots of shows, let's be real, sort of botch up once they toss in the random romantic interest that they're planning on dropping later. Uh, Jaya, what do you... Do you have anything to add? You all... She died. <laughs> she <Yeah>. is gone. <laughs> Poor Jaya. That... Okay, I guess uh, technical difficulties here, yes, but okay. Yes, so. Until until she comes back, though, I will say that again. I don't really have much to say to the when it comes to it, everything that had a kind of said about Ron. I agree with basically, and this episode is very much about him. But and I like this one well. It seems it seems like he, he they're kind of starting to hint towards. He has some different motivations. He has some different changes of how to regard his job. So I like that. Uh, also, welcome back, Jaya. Uh -huh. Sorry. Did I get um, <laughs> You came back. You are also, you're also cutting off just a bit. Apologies. Hmm. I was okay. just saying I appreciated that they keep emphasizing that that Ron may have a conscience, but he's not nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. He has that complexity, and so it makes his role believable. Oh, shoot, I'm talking over you. Sorry. I think that... I think Cognito is listening. They're trying to sabotage the internet connections. She, she knows too much. They're blocking her. <laughs> uh, well, Jaya, in case in case the uh, thing dies, I am. Um, I guess uh, we did kind of say everything we have to say about episode six. So do you want to move on to seven, and we'll catch up from there? <laughs> Oh, 
o outro é da Jai, your connection is really is like really bad. Dude. We can barely mm. hear you. Unfortunately, yeah. Very robot right now. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, unfortunately just hopefully you'll get the connection back when you do. We will cheer, I guess <laughs> at this point in time. Yeah, we don't really have too much to say more about 6 and we can go on to 7 in the meantime. Yeah, well, let's move on to seven and worst case scenario we'll backtrack a bit. So episode seven, Project Reboot. I've seen Haddock saying this and I will say it before before Haddock this time because I completely agree with it. I need a spin-off about Rand and JR in a college that being was roommates. So good. I would have it. Give me that. Like I'm one of those suckers who likes um sort of school environment stories like even after i left high school i was still writing high school stories much unlike most people that i know and college stories are something that i don't think really get tapped on very good so when you get a good college roommate sort of vibe going on there's so so much potential that you can deal with and just seeing the glimpse of those two as roommates with their contrasting personalities but common goal it was just such a treat i had a blast watching that flashback yeah uh wolf what about you no it was fun like <laughs> as said we got the kazam slash shazam joke which was very fun and enjoyable but uh yeah, like, it, it was, I very much also enjoyed seeing the backstory for how JR and Rand met, and just them being in college together. Very fun, would very much like more of that. That was fun. And the fact, uh, you know, and also the fact they started out, uh, like, as rivals, became friends, and are now rivals again. There's something fun about that you could argue they were never really friends, they were just, you know, um, convenient for each other, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. They were sort of put into each other's lives, realized that the other could get them further, and just built that relationship ship off of end goals, not any like compassion for Rel each other. Question: I know, I know, it was just a mistake, but is relationship what they call in one of the alternate universes? They you can arrive with oh uh, with their machine. <laughs> I'm sorry, the jump was there. I couldn't ignore it. But yeah, no, I I literally could talk about it for a while and I don't like comparing shows like, oh, they clearly took this one from Gravity Falls and put this in here because that's not how it really works. But, you know, no. for me as a fan who always liked the um, Fiddleford and Ford stuff with them mm -hmm. being either college roommates or being science bros in the woods. That sort of relationship mm -hmm. where you have two people in close quarters doing science with very questionable means. It's just such a great dynamic. And this was a yeah. very much non-friendly version, non-children's version where we're killing dogs. Yeah. And like that, yeah. It just sort of evoked that concept to me since I like that sort of concept. Except this time I could enjoy it in the full dynamics of no stops. We're going to kill people. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is what the, uh, this, I guess Alex Hirsch was kind of like telling the, you know, like, yeah, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but he was going to be on the show. Like, Listen, you need to give me the chance to do this because I can do this at Disney. Let's do this here. Let's just, let's actually have the, 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 you know, the adult quote unquote version of this here. But also, Project Reboot. Is a very, is a very it was a very interesting concept, and I like the fact that you know they created this, but like everything, there's a, there are serious consequences for it, and the consequences is that reality can fall apart if you actually use this thing, aka the Kazam poster and a bunch of other small details that kind of change. But the other, the other thing that, you know, was interesting to me and I was glad to see, which was interesting to see and experience was that when the other, the other crew members see what their alternate selves are, 
and they actually go and they actually go to experience those, but at the end they still come back to sex. And when and you know Brett, while Brett keeps by her side, she's the one that tells her no, enjoy your alternate life. And you know Reagan sacrifices the you know having her best friend basically so that he could have a good time, that he could have a good life. Right, and a choice. I, I, Welcome I back, the, by the way. Thanks. thanks. I think the choice is the important thing, because I think it hit home when the rest of the team accused Reagan that they didn't want her to be happy. They did, she didn't want them to be happy. Mm-hmm. And it, was, uh, and it yeah. wasn't it was true, obviously, because she's right. They sometimes need a bit of tough love. Yes. And so perhaps. And so I think her decision was actually completely sound given the childhood. But I do appreciate she thought about it. The fact that Brett didn't leave her. And she saw his timeline and said, you deserve to be happy. If we succeed, we'll see, I'll see you soon. If I don't, if we fail, you'll at least be happy. Mm-hmm. There was a very nice and sense of show... stakes throughout this whole episode. Mm. Yeah. And then we get to we get to Rand, who kind of has this entire idea of all this for you. And initially, I didn't like this. I, no. because I, I get the entire idea. I was like, oh, I did this for you and stuff. But if I may kind of get you back to something I said in the Kingdom Hearts uh, episode we did a few months ago. How far can you really go with that excuse? Because in this particular case, I'm like, fuck off, you did it just for her. You took away a lot of the stuff that she was after. And now you say that you just did it because you wanted it, because you wanted her back, you wanted to be her father again. Give me a break. But the more I thought about it, yeah, that was kind of the point. He wanted this, but he went about the completely wrong way of doing this, and the show does call him out for it. it, it just right. because he had this like sympathetic motivation, he's still kind of an asshole. Not kind of, he is an asshole for the stuff he's done in order to get both Reagan and Kamiko back to him. But like we said earlier. I think this season kind of forgot about him and Reagan's relationship after rep- past the first episode, and that didn't make it as strong as it could have been. There's like, it's there. It's almost it's almost coming out, but it's like there's something. There's this one thing that's missing, and when that prevents this from being a really good scene. Yeah, one thing is that. It feels more of a narcissistic motivation because Rand is a narcissist. It's been established quite clearly. It's what he and Tomiko have in common. The but is it's, his motivation is selfish because he's trying to get what he wants back without putting the work in. Like starting with a sincere apology to Reagan, being actually romantic on his date with Tomiko, you know, not because he wants to avoid that. But I think. I do wish we had seen what he had seen if they had had more time to do a three-parter, if he had seen all these timelines. And you, if you count the tally marks on the wall, it's at least 50 that he tried. But no matter what he, he saw, Tommy Go and Reagan left him. And going back to the Bojack Horseman thing, is that it's not the, it's not the alcohol, it's not your tragic backstory, or variables beyond your control. So they certainly can't help, as we saw with Reagan and Ron's relationship. It's you. And I think Rand was realizing that. Which is what makes the devastation much quieter. It would be one thing if he had tried justifying it the way he did in the season one finale, when Reagan find out he erased Orin from her mind. Because then would be we would be on Reagan's side when she said, Barrow, let me kill him. Yeah, yeah so but, it's... Yeah, the the lack of just I like everything you're saying here. Both the fact that he didn't try to justify it showed like a tiny step of character progress, and also it's very much building off of everything that we've seen in Rand through the entire series, as you said, where he tries to manipulate things 
the way he selfishly wants it without putting in any of the social interactions, any of the actual work that it would take to do it in a healthy way. So the, right. the basis of the motivations very, very much makes sense for why Rand would do it. But as HC said, it was just that missing piece of we needed to see Rand and Reagan interacting a little bit for this to hit home successfully. There but needed... I did... Yeah. There needed to be that build up. Mm -hmm, exactly. I, I will say I think there was build up, but I don't think it was for... I don't think it was for the wrong things. I just think it was not necessarily where all of their focus should have been on. Mm -hmm. And I say there, this build up was there because I think the build up was focused on the idea of work and personal like it felt like that's very much kind of the the through line for this <clears throat> season or part in so much as you you can't really work at like say co you know cognito inc and have a personal life or at least a good one it just doesn't work out very well if you do you're going to have problems or if you're too focused on one or the other you're going to have problems with the other it doesn't no matter it, it's going to happen no matter what at least for these characters and rand is someone who just cannot accept that he wants all of that he wants his perfect timeline but he's just he's not going to find it because of who he is he can't focus on one or the other he has to have them both but in order to do that he and he you know you you can't, it's, again, he's going to fail in doing that every single time because of who he is. <laughs> Words, I know them, I can use yep. them. <laughs> but yeah, it, and right. I think it's a great contrast from what we see in episode eight with Reagan. Right. And it's implied he and that Rand and Reagan saw the same timelines, just different facets of them, because Robata said he pulled his data from the timelines that Rand caused. Which means it's highly likely that Rand saw all of those timelines failing for Reagan, where she and Ron end up miserable. And maybe yeah. that gave, I'd like to think the, that gave him the perspective, which is why I kind of wish this had been a three parter, so that there would have been time to take that moment to see what Rand was seeing that made him break down on the floor and just desperately play, just desperately trying to find one that worked. And playing home videos on loop. I like the concept of us not seeing what he saw, but we just see the after effect of him being sort of a wreck. I like that concept. Mm. Where, you know, I really loved the stakes of episode 7. Like, I had an absolute blast going through it. The whole, you know, reality's changing as they're going along and they're racing through. It, it's, it's so much fun. And I really like the concept of them just, when they finally get there, instead of seeing, like, some, you know, complete asshole Rand just yelling at them, he's just a wreck. Because it that's what it takes for somebody to be doing these resets repeatedly, knowingly destroying the world. Is, you're, you're screwed up. I don't think they executed yeah. it perfectly, but I really like the concept. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Right. Mm -hmm. I think so, too. And the fact that it wasn't even a fight, like, I appreciate Reagan did not trust Ren, and she was gonna go Doc Ock on him. Yeah. I, was, I but, want that to be a cosplay. I want to cosplay that. <laughs> anyway. Please. But it's interesting. But, but yeah, Ren's no, other actions come movie. back to bite him as well. Um, so, after this, uh, so, you know, Ren is actually sent to the Shadow Prison X, and with JR. In yeah, with JR. And we don't really see them in the final episode of the season, which makes me wonder what are they actually going to do with them moving forward. I am curious about that. But definitely we'll get to do something. But we'll get we'll get to this later because we still have one more episode to go through, which is Apleton. And yep. I think this is probably the most emotional the show went, and they did it swell uh, when it comes I to Reagan and cried yeah. my eyes out. Uh, it, <laughs> it was painful. It was definitely painful. Like when she sees all of those other, well, all the alternate uh, possibilities where they are just not gonna end up being happy. 
and everything. And the one and there's this one timeline which she which she sees Ron is gonna be happy, and that's the one where he's not with her. But she doesn't yeah. like ouch. Roll in the field. Yeah. For me, what hurts is that in all those timelines, Reagan becomes Rand, whether or not she's at Cognito. Because that's horrifying. Yeah. Reagan has spent the whole season yeah. proving she's not her father. She can make the hard decisions while retaining her empathy. Something that Brett mentioned, that, and something the team also mentioned, that the reason why they can't respect Brett as a leader when Reagan temporarily puts him in charge is Red as a marshmallow. That he <laughs> exists to please people. And he won't make yeah. the hard choices. He does eventually, but we'll get to that later. But it's absolutely mm-hmm. horrifying. Like, Reagan in one timeline brings back Barrow, which I like Barrow. But that's a sign of how far that timeline is. And it's implied Ron shoots himself in another one. The way she treats mm-hmm. him, the way Ray- Ran treated her as a child, <laughs> that she infantilizes him. With the memory gun. Someone says yeah. he shoots himself is... is- is a little bit leading. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure which gun it was, but given her horror, it would, didn't look like he was racing his memories. I get you. It was the memory gun, though. We should try to not be so leading with that one, though. That's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's it. But considering what she saw, that could have been an, an outcome as well. But again, like, I, I agree. It's it's very interesting like it's it's i did not expect this to be the twist they would go with this right yeah because i knew there was going to be a twist i was like he's introduced way too early to be the end game romance his character arc is clearly in conflict with reagan i was wondering if he they were going to split and then eventually come back together something going on like that um you know because there's a whole setup of him wanting to go away her wanting to stay and i'm like okay you know maybe that's going to be their breakup point but i was not expecting it to literally come together like this and it was just a plus to the writers just yeah like i was even sitting here for this episode like i didn't i wasn't aware that there was going to be a season two until after i started doing a little bit of research into it and i was very much like are they going to end it with them like leaving? Is that going to be Reagan's arc where she finally says, yeah, you know what? I don't mm-hmm. want to turn into my father. Let's forget everything and do something different. But no, like they genuinely surprised me with this in so much as she realizes that Ron can never be happy with her because she's still not <clears throat> come to that point of, can she live without one or the other? Right. She's still trying to figure yeah. that out. And it's just, it's great. It's wonderful how they end this and seeing her have to say goodbye to him. It's just great. So well done. Yeah. Well and, done, indeed. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, just uh, another thing, if we can't, because we, I think we kind of cover the same. There's a point where, so now Reagan does kind of take over Tagnido with Rand being in shadow. Yep. Them, and and so she's summoned to meet um, what uh, the Shadow Lord, mm-hmm. and they kind of, and you know, they give her the usual new, you know, new new CEO, new position kind of speech about about you know the Shadow Lord is basically a bunch of people who were there since humanity began, and how they were always like saw things a bit differently, and that's how they evolved. So we see that there's like a, this like prehistoric version of Reagan who was like the first uh, innovator. And probably, you know, just to get the idea across from something, but I, for a second, I was sure one of the Shadow Board members was just going to take on the mask and you would see Reagan there. And she's like, I, I'm, your, like I'm your ancestor or something. Like, you are part of me. I, you know, there's a reason why you are like this. I, I'm glad I didn't do this, right? But for a second, I was like, yeah. I hope you're not. Please, no. This will make no I sense. I agree. Please. <laughs> it is also interesting. She wanted in the pilot. And he's in that for Sally. Because they all spontaneously, all the employees spontaneously throw her a welcome back party. And they say it's good to have her as a leader, which is what she's always wanted. 
But because of what's happening with Ron, she has to think about if it's what she wants anymore. Because this was Ran's dream, not hers. And at that point when she's debating if the rogues intervene, implying they said they've been watching her. So it's implied they knew there was a chance she would give it up and they still need her. But the fact that they had a chopper for her in Appleton, like she didn't call them, you could see, but she was not surprised. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess the other, the other thing to talk about is, you know, the breath uh, beat plot. Listen, I, I would, think I, yeah. would, Brett, I wouldn't <laughs> kill Airbud either. Yeah, no, no, I was sitting no, there being like, Brett, you have her. to. I'm actually, I feel like there's going to be consequences for his choices in a bad way. Oh, absolutely. I want there to be. If they did not have bad consequences also, for absolutely. it, and they just played it as comedy, I would be upset because I feel like this should have bad consequences because he, he's playing with reality just because of one dog. I absolutely. Well, he found too. a solution. But, he found a third oh, option. He says it's a solution. He says. If they yeah. actually make that he a solution, said. that is a cop-out. I love, though, that have, <laughs> I love, I, though, that their solution funny. is it's literally, funny. Yeah, it's it literally is funny. just I like it. the whole, but, like, yeah. plot point in Air Bud of dogs can't play. It's the rules. And there is no rules. I love that the plot point from Air Bud is his solution. It's so dumb. Mm-hmm. It's so good. I hope there's consequences for this. I hope they do something with this. But... I'm with Brett. I wouldn't kill him either. Yeah. He, I mean, Golden Retriever is like, he's a friendly Golden Retriever and implied to be <laughs> knowing why Brett's trying to save him. The one thing yeah. is, I think it might, my guess is it'll go the way it happened with Robotus because in season one, the team told Reagan she was stupid for keeping Robotus. Yeah, I do like that Robotus has become a part of the team. It genuinely entertains me. Yeah. And I'm sure the Airbud will keep on returning back again. But again, like, I, I don't know. I don't want Brett to go out scot-free for that because, you know, love dogs, you know, etc. As he does, it's, it's irresponsible. Like, it would, it would lead to something. At the it very, we be, know. I want it to lead to something. I, all right. <laughs> Considering we have our, our ending here where, in this episode, where we get set up for our season two, which is the shadow board reveals that, you know, bringing Reagan on board is basically a distraction for her. And they are moving forward with their secret plan called Project X-37. I hope that... Brett saving Air Bud is rolled into this, oh, the Shadow Board is actually the Evolved Dogs. And that's what this whole thing leads into. You know, his decision here, basically, altering the timeline is what set the Shadow Board in motion. I never hope. would have thought of that. Like, I don't or... care what the consequence is. I just want there to be some follow-up. <laughs> I do appreciate also that Brett it's interesting that Brett also, to an extent, gets what he wants, is that he gets everyone to like him. But instead of in the pilot, when they were just blindly, blithely listening to him, they're all like, yeah, Brett's in charge, let's take the day off. <laughs> and Brett's like, come on! <laughs> and he... No, I, I, I also said, he... right, I said it before, right? like, it was really good setup of episode five, and then getting to hear where, hey, Brett's no longer a yes man, he's actually not being a pushover. Yeah, sure, he does have a gun, and they might right. be a little bit scared of the gun, but <laughs> details. <laughs> well, well, he also has a strong slap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Apparently, Andre finds his a turn-on, which I have so many questions about. Yeah, yeah. let's uh, let's not question the kinks people have in this universe, because, you know, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to get it. I'm not opening this, though. Yeah, I am tempted to write... About how it's implied Brett has on as an actor. He likes the fact that they're business friends, which would explain why he doesn't like Ron, why he's not on you considering leaving Cognito Wink and her memories behind. It's one of those and he it would, rather than whether honestly. But sometimes I kind of like them. I kind of like them as platonic, uh, as platonic friends. So I don't know. I just. 
Like, it's I, possible. I, 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 I really want it to stay platonic. I've only gotten platonic vibes, and the did not like Ron was something I really liked, because this is a real thing that happens in friendship circles all the time, is you try to bring two groups together, and oh crap, they don't get along. Uh, I love uh, yeah. that, and I want them to stick mm. with that. Yeah, I Bring mean, I mean, the thing that really clinched it really lazy for me was writing. Sorry, continue. Yeah, the, what clinched? Yeah, what clinched for me was Brett having him, he because Brett's ventriloquy comes back when after he saves Air Buddy's like, I wish Ray, maybe you can be the Ray, and he says, Brett, I love you platonically, and I'm like, oh, that, that's telling. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very strong word to use to say you love a friend. And not that it's a bad thing. Friendship love is amazing. And then... But I feel like it might have been Brett subconsciously was jealous of Ron, which is why he didn't like it, in addition to Ron being a douchebag. Let's be real. You can also be jealous Who's... of somebody in a platonic way. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I do hope they don't go that plot line because seeing it play out in Danny Phantom is a little iffy, and I love it so much I've been hooked on it, but it definitely, I do hope they don't go that way, because I do like the Ron Stoppable and Kim Possible dynamic that Reagan and Ron have before the two hooked up, the way Reagan and Brett have before Kim and Ron hooked up. I mean, yeah, I guess. The, uh, so, anything else to kind of say about Inside Job um, season two, or are we just gonna talk about what we what we expect of yeah, season like, let's, three let's or season two expect, part you know. one? It, I say, uh, you know, well, no, this is season one part two, so it's not season two part two. That's not how it works, HC. It's it's. Unique. No, no. So I said. So I said. Do you want to about season three or season two part one? Oh, okay. Fair. Never mind then. I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Stop calling it parts, Netflix. I... <laughs> anyway, I so what do you guys want to see in the ne- in the next part or next season, whatever you want to call it? Uh, I so had a call. He said that uh, you know. Uh, Brett sparing Airbud needs to have some sort of consequence. Yep. Yes. Hmm. Like, I don't um, even care if it's a uh, small consequence, like, you know, a B plot or C plot or something. I just want it to. I just. That's. that's it has to. I agree. Especially for something as large as a finale episode. Don't leave mm-hmm. that hanging, sort of thing. And I, I yeah, would say the show's been pretty decent at, you know, picking up on those little small threads. Even if it's not, like, a huge payoff, it's still, there's a payoff to it, right? So I'm curious what they'll yes. do with it. Yep. But it's definitely something I would like to see and hope they don't leave behind. I I want to juggle up. We've seen the Catholic, Catholic Church, we've seen the Illuminati, and we've seen the Rogue. But we do not know why the juggle run the world as well. Mm. <laughs> Agree. I mean, that's a, that's a good point, which makes me wonder. This is something that might come into Project uh, Project X thirty seven. Like, mm. we, so we know we know that there are more beings, you know, more, more beings in this universe that kind of have control over over things. So, there, so the question now. It, so, so the question now is, what exactly? You know, now that Reagan is officially dead of Cognito, and you know she's into she's brought up on the shadow board and everything. What does this entail? What does this? Uh, right. know, wh- where does this go? Obviously, right. gonna, gonna be something we'll discover next season. I I hope so. So, yeah. but uh, in terms of the other stuff, I I guess kind of. What what would be you know where where would things go with Brad? Is he actually going to be just the head of this team now? And now that Reagan is the head of this team, and where does this go? Like you know, now right. that Reagan is the head of it. What's gonna happen there? I'm curious to see how the characters are gonna develop in these new situations. Mm-hmm. We have them there. Agree. That's what I also. Want to say. Also, the implication that Reagan's going to get along with every conspiracy member 
Like, her dad and Dietrich, the guy who runs the Illuminati, hated each other. Dietrich congratulates yeah. her and gives her a swanky throne, which he likes. <laughs> I guess I, I guess you know uh, yeah. some people think that uh, that uh, the kids are uh, fixing what the parents did. So yeah, theologically, yeah, theologically speaking, I'm wondering how VIP heaven works the way the Pope puts it. I have a feeling that Martin Luther would have a lot to say about that. Most likely. So who's gonna so which animatronic or clone incognito ink is gonna be nailing 95 pieces to the wall? Um, and no comment of uh, yet of now. Ask me like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. So, anything else to add, or shall we wrap this discussion up? I don't have a strong mm-hmm. of sense of what season two is gonna be like, as I did have some ideas of what this second part of season one was going to be like. So I'm sort of holding off and waiting to see what they want to do with it. So I don't really have like a ton of expectations. You know, it's just what you said. Obviously, we're going to be developing Shadow Board, Reagan's leadership, etc. And I'm content just to see what they introduce. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess that's all for this episode of the Outcast. We hope you enjoyed. What are your thoughts about Inside Jobs Season 1, Part 2? I hate how they did this. You can tell us still about it in the comment section below, on our Twitter, which is Bellcast with a capital B, capital C, and on our Tumblr, which is Bellcast theme. Adek, where can people find you on the interwebs? Um, I mean, I'm still not exactly everywhere on the interwebs. The most easy way to reach me is still going to be on Tumblr at King of the Wilderwest. Um, that's, yeah, that's going to be about it, I think, so. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Jaya, welcome, people. I'm you. So you can find me on Twitter as it goes down through its Rose, Death Rose, if you believe the internet, at SFF, the down dash Shreether, S R I D H A R. I'm also under Medium under Priya Shreether, and I'll be posting some inside job articles, I hope, this month about season two. And I'm on Mastodon under my real name, Priya J. Shreether. If you join Mastodon, come post some toots for the prehistoric pachyderm. I had no idea this was a website, so I hope people and people who do check it, uh, you know, yes. find you there. And on that, yes. uh, so, but on that note, we will see you all next time. Take care. And Bye-bye. the Illuminati is apparently real or some shit. Bye-bye. Buy gold. <laughs> illusion, illusion. Reality is an illusion. Buy gold. Bye. <laughs> to quote Bill Cipher. Bye-bye. <laughs>